Good morning. It is so good to be with you all in the house of the Lord. Would you join me as we worship together this morning? Feel free to stand and let us lift our praise and um, just glorify our Lord together this morning. Almighty God. Almighty God, my Redeemer, my hiding place, my safe refuge. No other name like Jesus, no power can stand against you. My feet are planted on this rock, and I will not be shaken. My hope, it comes from you alone, my Lord and my salvation. Your praise is always on my lips. Your word Almighty God, Almighty God, my Redeemer, my hiding place, my safe refuge, no other name like Jesus, no power can stand against you. My feet are planted on this rock, and I will not be shaken. From you alone, my Lord and my salvation, your praise is always on my lips, your word is living in my heart, and I will praise you with a new song, my soul will bless you, Lord, you fill my life with greater joy, yes I delight myself in All things are possible. All things are possible. Your praise is always on my lips. Your word is living in my heart. And I will praise you with a new song. My soul will bless you, Lord. You fill my life with greater joy. God that does all things and that are that he makes all things possible. Amen. Would you uh, take that to your neighbor and celebrate in the God of the possible this morning? Let's continue to celebrate our wonderful Savior this morning and glorify his name together. Let's uh, continue to lift up his praise this morning as we worship. Mm -hmm. 
Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord God Almighty. Great is the Lord on high. The train of his robe fills the temple, and we cry out highest praise. Glory to the risen King. Glory to the Son. Glorious Son. Lift up your heads. Lift up your heads, open the doors, let the King of glory come in and forever be our God. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is the Lord to worship our Savior and our Heavenly Father together this morning. It's, it is good to be in his presence. Let's continue worshiping him. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. And everything I need is in you. Every 
everything I need. Christ, my all in all, the joy of my salvation. And this hope will never fail. Heaven is our home. Through every storm, my soul will sing. Jesus is here. To God be the glory. Christ is enough for me. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Christ is enough. Christ is enough for me. turning back I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back no turning back no turning back How many of you needed that reminder this morning that Christ is enough, no matter your circumstances, no matter what you're going through, that he is truly enough? Did you need that reminder this morning? Um, I have been privileged over the last few months to be able to uh, share in a ministry with Amy Barber. We go to Olive Branch um, and are able to, um, once a month, just share some music and a message with them, um, with the people there, and it has just been a real blessing, um, and, uh, one of the things that we got to do recently was we went in and sang a bunch of hymns, um, and Amy had a notebook, or a, a devotional book that had all of the stories of, um, where those hymns came from, and where, how they were developed, um, where, what the people, what the authors were feeling, um, and just why they wrote them. And so, as we sing this next hymn, I loved that idea of being able to share the story behind the song. And so, um, we're singing this song, Because He Lives, and it was written by um, Gloria Gaither and uh, Bill Gaither. And so, uh, Gloria had shared that in um, this time as the song was coming together, uh, Bill was really sick, and they were expecting their third child, and it was a period of just mental and emotional anguish for Gloria. And the thought of bringing another child into the world with all of the craziness was taking its toll on her. And then in the midst of all of the fear and the agony and um, all of these just dark emotions, she was reminded and she saw the attentiveness and love of her heavenly father. And so she said, We are reminded that Christ came to this earth, and the purpose for his coming was that we might be able to face tomorrow with all of the uncertainty that it brings. 
She also reminds us that God's hold the, God holds the future right in his hands and makes life worth living for all who trust in him. So as we sing this song, no matter um, what you're feeling this morning, where you are emotionally, um, we know that we can trust in the God of all things, who makes all things possible, who does all things. And so would you continue to worship with us as we lift up the name of our, our Savior and our God who is... Um, who has all the power and who does all things. Let's continue worshiping. God sent his son they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives, because he lives, I can tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because Christ lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he then one day and then one day I'll cross the river I'll find life's final war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know join me as we pray together this morning. Lord Jesus, would you draw near to us now and hear our prayers? You have given us today to continue living in the in-between. You promised those of us who have believed in our hearts and confessed with our mouths that you are Lord, that we are new creations, that the old has gone and the new has come. And Lord, while we know that we are saved and that our salvation is complete, we also still live in this broken world. And while sin and death no longer reign over us, they sometimes still have power in our lives. And Lord, we confess that one way this often 
manifests itself in us is in fear and doubt and anxiety. We fear so many things, big and small. Lord, we need your help. We don't want to be afraid or doubt. We want to trust you. We want to be a people marked by faith in you, even when we can't see the path ahead. Lord Jesus, would you hear our prayers? We pray for faith because you are the author of our faith. And faith isn't a work we have to muster. Rather, you give it to us. And so, Lord, we pray that you would increase our faith in the areas where we are fearful and where we have doubt. Would you help us to let go of the ways that we idolize the visible and the known in our lives? Would you help us when we are tempted to make idols out of your provisions themselves? Help us not to just pursue material health and wealth, but to trust your promise that you'll, you will use all things for good in our lives. Help us to have faith in you, rather in the things that we can control. Help us to hide your promises about fear and doubt in our heart through scripture memory. You know the way we fear and the way that doubt can take over our minds. And we know your word is full of, of verses and scripture that call us away from fear and anxiety. You will never leave us or forsake us. Don't be anxious about anything. Do not fear, for you have redeemed us. Lord, we also pray that you would guard us from the whispers of the enemy in the areas where we are prone to fear and doubt. Would you help us to realize and use the power you have given us to fight those voices and the ways that they try to deceive us? We know you love us, and we are thankful for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that we don't have to earn our way back to you. Would you continue to hear our prayers this morning? Be with us as we continue to worship you. We thank you for this time to be in your presence. We pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Wasn't it good to have uh, John Comstock here, stock here yesterday, uh, last week? He was, he did a wonderful job sharing with us about uh, about uh, how that uh, his own journey uh, through mental illness and through uh, struggles that he had experienced, and uh, not looking at that as a stigma, but being really honest about where we're at and what we're going through. And it's such an important part of what we're uh, called to do. And so uh, I just enjoyed his opportunity to share that. Uh, there's still cards in the back that you can fill out if you'd like to. If you're struggling, we'd like to know that. We'd like to be able to help if there's any way we can do that. Uh, we're looking at the series Honest to God and um, talking about the idea of being honest before God and being the most honest place in town. And uh, thought about what that would look like. What would it look like if we were the most honest place in town? And, and one of the things we would have to deal with right away, if we were uh, known as the most honest place in town, we would have to come to grips with sometimes where our profession doesn't meet up our, to our life, right? I mean, so often we have a great profession about this is who we are, and it doesn't always meet up to the reality of who we are. And so we've been talking some about that, about confession, about recognizing that. But this morning we're going to look at a story of Peter, who uh, had a great profession, but it didn't, it didn't he didn't follow through with that. Um, the church must be a people who are resembling Christ. I like Gandhi's uh, quote where he said, I like your Christ, but your Christians are not like your Christ. <laughs> Sometimes that's the case. And so when we say we are Christians, it means we are following Christ. Do we follow him? Do we follow him when it is uncomfortable, when the road is difficult? 
Uh, is it Jesus who we are following, or is it just our own version of Jesus who we are following? Uh, honestly, are we following Jesus, or are we just following our own desires, our own agendas, what we, what we want ourselves? And so that's where we get to Peter. Uh, Peter, at first glance, when you look at Peter, and we're going to look at two passages in Matthew chapter 26. At first glance, when you uh, look at Peter, you think he's a pretty honest guy, right? Because he, he, he didn't, he was one of those people who really didn't have a filter, right? He just said whatever he thought. Um, often spoke without thinking. Of course, I love the, love the quote that I quoted a few weeks ago. It is a dangerous thing to confuse speaking without thinking for the same as speaking the truth, right? Just because we speak without thinking doesn't mean we're speaking the truth because what we may be saying is not the truth. And, and Peter believed he spoke the truth when he told Jesus, I am never going to deny you. When everyone else walks away, I won't. In fact, I, will, I am ready to die for you. And just a few hours after he said that, he denied Jesus three times. And so we're going to look at this story. Matthew's gospel tells the story, Matthew 26. There's two different readings that we're going to look at in Matthew 26. Uh, the first one is at the Last Supper. And then the second one is after Jesus is arrested, he is taken to the, the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, and he is on trial there. So first reading, Matthew 26, verse 31, Jesus at the Last Supper. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, This very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. And so Peter makes that bold statement at the Last Supper that he will never deny Jesus and that he would even die for Jesus. And when the crowd arrived with their swords uh, ready and clubs ready to arrest Jesus in the garden, uh, Peter was ready to fight. Peter pulled out the sword and took a swipe at the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Fortunately, his aim was not as good as he thought he was, so he only took off the ear. Jesus intervened. He healed the servant's ear, and then he told Peter to put the sword away. Uh, and he says, Peter, do you not know that, it, that, if I, that I could call the Father right now, and he would send 12 legions of angels here? Uh, if I wanted to fight Peter, I wouldn't be choosing you with your poor aim. <laughs> I would call on the angels of heaven to come and fight for me. And so then when it is clear that Jesus is not going to fight and Peter has to put away his sword, then Peter and all the disciples run away. The fight and flight, right? We've got two responses to crisis, fight, flight. Well, he tried fighting and now, he flew, now they, they fled. Once safe from the soldiers, Peter watches at a distance. He follows the soldiers uh, to Caiaphas' house, and he takes a seat among the temple guards watching the trial that is going on. Peter is listening to them as they bring in false testimony, as they bring in false witness after false witnesses. You can just see him burning inside as they are saying lies about his Lord. And then finally, the high priest says to Jesus, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, it is at, yes, you have said so. But I say to all of you, Jesus said, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One coming on the clouds of heaven. And with that, the high priest tore his clothes and said, he is speaking blasphemy. He is worthy of death. And so they began to spit on Jesus and they began to slap him and strike him. 
And Peter watches all of this, and then he goes out into the courtroom, courtyard. And then we pick up our reading, verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You were also here with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken, Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So see, I believe Peter was sincere when he said he will never deny Jesus. I think he sincerely believed that he would be ready to die with Jesus. I think Peter was, was, was one of these kind of people who never lacked confidence in himself. I believe Peter probably viewed himself as an heroic individual. He is never going to back down from a challenge. He is not going to whimper away. When Jesus was walking on the water and Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, he said, tell me to come to you and I will. And Peter jumped out of the boat and started walking to Jesus. All the other disciples just sat and watched. They were bystanders. That's not the kind of person Peter was. He is not a bystander. He is a get in on the action kind of guy. And so Peter was very confident in himself. And he probably gained a little more confidence with that sword on his side Luke's gospel tells us that the disciples only had two swords Peter had one of them maybe he had both of them we don't know but Peter had at least one of them and he was ready to fight and so he pulls out the sword ready to go he is in a sense ready to fight for the Lord he is ready to defend the Lord but when Jesus tells him to put his sword away he suddenly doesn't know what to do he has no confidence what can I do how can I fight and as Jesus is humiliated in that trial scene I think the reality begins to sit in, sink in that Jesus is actually going to die and so he heads out in the courtyard and then he the first servant girl comes and he plays dumb I don't know what you're talking about. The second servant comes and says, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I don't know the man. And he did something the Lord told him not to do. Don't make oaths. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. But he has to try to prove uh, that he's telling the truth because he's actually lying. I don't know the man. And then when those gathered around came and said, we can tell he's, you're one of his disciples by your accents. He calls down curses and swears. I do not know the man. And the rooster crows. And Peter leaves and weeps outside. So what we find in Peter is that he makes a lot of promises to Jesus. But he fails to keep them. He has a lot of self-confidence. And he really thinks he's in charge. He really thinks he thinks how, sees how things are going to happen. Peter may be sincere in his profession but he is not dealing with the truth and there's a difference I can be sincere about something and still be dead wrong right I can be sincere I can sincerely believe that I can play Beethoven's fifth symphony on the piano <laughs> I can convince myself that I can do it but but, but I'm never dealing with reality. You can't just walk over to a piano and start playing. There's more to it than that. <laughs> and in our story, I, I think you will see that Peter makes a sincere promise to Jesus, but he is not dealing with reality any more than I would be re dealing with reality thinking that I can play Beethoven on a piano without even practicing or learning how to play the piano. 
Peter does not believe that Jesus is going to die. He said exactly that. Earlier in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, he tells them, uh, I'm going to die. There, I'm going to be betrayed. Uh, I'm going to suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. I'm going to be killed and on third day raised to life. And Peter takes Jesus aside and said, no, this is not going to happen. Never this is going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen. There's no way this is going to happen. That thought is completely unreal to Peter that Jesus would be crucified. He is not going to let it happen, and he's got a sword at his side to help him make sure it will not happen. So when it begins to happen, Peter is totally unprepared for it. He is totally unprepared. For it. It's so unreal to him. Three times in Matthew's gospel, we read that, P, that Jesus tries to convince the disciples that this is actually going to happen. In Matthew 16, he tells them, this is going to happen. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to go to trial. I'm going to be crucified. He says that in Matthew 17. And then he says it in Matthew 20. Three times Matthew records where Jesus explicitly says, this is going to happen to me. And yet the disciples never seem to let that resonate in their minds. They, they just are in complete denial that that's even a possibility, despite the fact that he tells them three different times explicitly this is going to happen. And the last time he tells them in Matthew 20, uh, the last time he tells them, as soon as he gets done, the disciples get in this argument. And do you know what the argument's about? Who's going to get to sit next to Jesus when he comes into his kingdom? They're arguing about who's going to get the best place in the kingdom that's coming. So get this. I mean, this is kind of amazing to think about. Jesus says to them, I'm going to suffer many things. I am going to be crucified. I'm going to die. And their response, great, man, let's, let's get ready for uh, the thrones. They're, they're beginning to argue because, because the cross is really no, has no reality in their mind. I mean, they're just jumping over the cross and going to the glorification, going to Jesus uh, receiving his crown. I think, and can't prove this, but I think the disciples, the more things became tense, the more be, they became dangerous for Jesus, the more the disciples believed that Jesus was going to show his power that the more these uh, religious leaders pressed the issues and tried to crucify Jesus, tried to stone him, which they did, tried to stone him, the more they did that, that was just, they're just, Jesus is going to reveal himself, and they knew it was going to happen. And so the more tense it got, the more they thought we're closer to him revealing how powerful he is, because they had seen his power. They had seen him work miracles. They knew how powerful he was. And so every time Jesus talked about this tense-filled moment when, when the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law are going to come up against Jesus, uh, the disciples thought, okay, it's about ready to happen. And they were arguing over who's going to get in the best place in the kingdom, who's going to be the second in command. So they have no real understanding of what the cross is going to look like. And so Peter's denials did not start in the courtyard. Peter's denials started long before that. Peter was living in deniers, denial for much of the three years he was disciples. And so his sincere boast about dying with Jesus was not connected with reality. It was not serious, at least not deadly serious. He never understood what it really meant to go to the cross, that Jesus was going to die on a cross. It's unreal. It's not an honest conviction because it did not lie in reality. Sometimes Christians' convictions can be shallow. Michael Novak, in a, in a book that he wrote called Belief and Unbelief, talks about that. He talks that there are three kinds of convictions. There is, there is a public conviction, the first one. A public conviction are convictions that I want people to believe that I hold. 
So uh, we put public convictions out. We, we put them on Facebook or Instagram. We, we put them out for people to, to see. Uh, we post them for people to see so they know this is what we believe. And, um, but for some people, it's just a public confession. Nothing more than that. Brennan Manning tells the story of a, a woman who lay seriously ill in the hospital and her closest friend is there beside her reading the Bible to her. And a wanting comfort, the woman asks her friend, would you hold my hand? And on the other side of the bed, her husband grabs a hold of her hand as well, his wife's hand. He wants to comfort her because he considers himself very religious as well. And his wife kind of withdrew it back. And with deep sadness, she said, Herbert, you are not a believer. Your cruelty and callousness through the 40 years of our marriage tells me that your faith is an illusion. And so his prayers would have no comfort for her. Public convictions are just convictions that are made for people. It's what we want people to think they, we believe about them. We say them because we want people to think good of us, well of us. And then secondly, Michael Novak says there are private convictions. And private convictions are things that I sincerely believe, but they remain private. They are limited to my private life. They, they don't work out in everyday life. They don't work out in the real world, in the working day world. They are private convictions. We say we believe something and we think that we believe them, but we never live out the consequence of that belief. You know, we say, I believe that the chair will hold me, but I never sit on it. <laughs> so I never really trust it. Um, I believe one thing in private, but out in everyday life, it doesn't really make a difference. It's a private only conviction. There's a movie called Elmer Gantry. It's an older movie, and it tells a story about a, a 20, 20th century phony revival preacher who preaches with great force in the churches that he preaches in, but in between services, he is a drinker and a womanizer, and a reporter found out about this, and she interviewed him, and she asked him if he ever believed anything he preached, and he said, yes, I believe it when I'm preaching it. <laughs> but it stayed there. And that's public convictions. They, they, are, they are things we feel inside, but they never get translated out to everyday life. They never get translated out into the world. We never commit to the consequences of our faith. Gordon MacDonald talked about people who had... Uh, fickle convictions and it was always just based on feelings he, he says they had a feeling or a feeling had them till another feeling came and took its place and when a feeling was there they felt as if it would never go when it was gone they felt as if it had never been when it returned they felt as if it had never been gone it's just feelings that come and go there's no substance to it there's no concreteness to it Peter seems to have this private conviction. He says he will die with Jesus and he believes he will. But in the moment of crisis, he will not even speak up for Jesus when the servant girl asks him if he knows the man. And so there are private convictions or, or there are uh, public convictions and private convictions. And then uh, Michael Novak talks about the third kind of conviction, which are core convictions. And he says, this is what we really believe. This is what we really believe, and it demonstrates it by our life. And he talks about in our core convictions, we have these mental maps. We, we look at the world a certain way because we have certain convictions about the world. You know, uh, if, I, if I believe that fire is going to burn me, I, I stay away from it. I believe that. That's a mental map that we have. And so I order my life around these beliefs. My actions demonstrate my core convictions. So Michael Novak says, if you want to know what you really believe, you must become a student of your own behavior. How am I living? How am I behaving? 
It's not what I feel inside. It's not what I want other people to think. It's not how sincere I think I am. Uh, the heart can be deceitful above all else, Jeremiah says. If we really know what, or what we believe, then we look to our behavior. And the best indicator of our true beliefs is our actions. How are we acting? How are we living it out? And that's what Jesus was always concerned about. He was always concerned about our core convictions. I mean, he lived that way. He lived with a core conviction that his father was real, was with him all the time, and loved him, and his father was the one who he could trust, and he lived that out in everyday action. So, so he wasn't concerned about what people thought about him. That didn't bother him. His father is what was concerned about. He, he said, and, and I know we've talked a lot about fasting, and, and your responses to fasting have been great. I've loved hearing what God is doing in the midst of these fasting. But remember what Jesus said. He said, my food is to do the will of God. And that's the way he lived. I mean, the way I sometimes live with food, for food, he lived for the will of God. I mean, I think about what my next meal is going to be all the time. Uh, as soon as I go home, I'm looking for the fridge. What is there to eat all the time? I just look for food. God, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of God. I'm always looking for where I can do God's will. And he lived that way. And Jesus was interested in people's core convictions. He would say, many people will say, Lord, Lord, did not I do all these things in your name? He says, I did not know you because the one who does the will of my father, those are the ones I know. He said, you will know my disciples by their love. That's how you will know them. When, when you see people loving each other that way, you'll know them my disciples. And if they're not loving one another, then then their actions are not showing that they have core belief that they are my disciple. So Jesus says, we build our faith like we build a house, one block at a time. In obedience, we take a step of faith, one block at a time, and we move our private convictions into core convictions by trusting in the Lord, by putting our faith to work. And I become a student of my own behavior. And I see the areas where I'm not trusting in the Lord by how I behave. And I recognize that as an issue of faith. Lord, my disobedience to you is that I'm not trusting you like I should. My disobedience to you is that I'm not believing that you are Lord the way I should. And so I find out what my faith is by my behavior. You know, when I look at Peter, it wasn't that Peter was afraid to die. I mean, I think he was ready to be killed in the garden. But what Peter could not accept is that Jesus was going to the cross. Never, that will never happen to you. And Jesus tried to get him to see that. And the last time he tried to get Peter to see this was, was when he went, took him into the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, he took Peter, James, and John. He said, I want you to come with me into the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and he said, I want you to stay here and watch and pray with me so that you will not fall into temptation. And Jesus prays nearby with great drops of blood. He is overwhelmed by the stress of this moment. I mean, Jesus is not denying what the cross is going to be like. We see that. He is at the point of traumatic stress. Because he is fully understanding what the next few hours are going to reveal in his life. But Peter and the disciples, Peter, James, and John, are, are asleep. I mean, they're not bothered at all. It doesn't even, even keep them awake. I mean, imagine if you were having... going. Had a friend getting ready to go through that kind of trial and you could fall asleep on them? And so Jesus is praying, Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And we're going to look at uh, the rest of this journey in the next few weeks as we 
next week and Easter Sunday. But Jesus says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. That comes from someone who does not want to go through this. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And see the difference between Peter and Jesus? Peter recognizes fully what this moment is going to be like and says, I don't want to go through this. It caused such great intense pressure upon him that it demonstrated in these great drops of blood. And yet he said, I'll do it for your will. I'll do it out of love. The disciples are just asleep. (laughs) And Jesus is clearly frustrated by the disciples, as you can imagine you would be. Talk about feeling completely alone. The three closest disciples you bring with them so that they can participate with you, pray with you over this major thing, this this unbelievable thing that is about to happen. And they are asleep. And they could not even keep vigil with them. Uh, They did not come close, and Peter included, they did not come close to grasping what the cross was and the power of this moment. Peter was so confident in what the Messiah was going to look like. He was so confident that the Messiah would lead him into battle. He had his sword ready to go. But he did not believe at this point in a Messiah who would die on the cross. And so he stopped doing the one thing that he was called to do. Follow me, Jesus said. That's all you have to do, Peter. That's what he called him when he was out in the fisherman. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me into the garden. Follow me into the into the cross. Follow me all the way. That's all you have to do. Follow me. And Peter could not follow him. Hebrews says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Keep following Jesus keep looking at Jesus keep moving to Jesus and allow him to define where he is leading us and what he is calling us to Apostle Paul says a lot of people will put uh, pride in a lot of things a lot of people can boast about a lot of things a lot of people have accolades and a lot of people have awards a lot of people are impressed by their own righteousness a lot of people have a lot of things they can take pride in Paul said but I consider every one of my accomplishments to be garbage compared with this one thing knowing Christ I consider them all rubbish with knowing Christ, I've given up all my boast. I've given up all my confidence. There is only one thing and only one thing I do and only one thing I care about doing and one priority in my life, and that is knowing Jesus Christ and following Him. That is my core conviction. That is what matters to me, nothing else. And that's what it means to be a disciple. Are we following our own agenda? Or are we following the one who who went to the cross? Are we following the Jesus that we want him to be? Or are we listening to his voice and taking each step as he calls us? John's gospel provides an ending on Peter's story of denials. It's an interesting story, the ending there in John chapter 20, 21. Jesus is resurrected and appears to Peter. And uh, you may remember the story. They have this moment all by themselves. And uh, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And then Peter asked him a second time, or Jesus asked Peter a second time, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. 
And then the Lord asked him a third time. And, and it cannot be a coincidence. I mean, someone can imagine someone saying to you, do you love me? Yeah. Do you love me? Yeah. Do you really love me? And, and Peter is hurt by this. I mean, Peter probably understands. It's not a coincidence that he asked me three times if I love him after I denied him three times. He is asking me three times. Uh, and so, so Peter says, and it's very interesting what Peter says the third time. He said, Lord, you know all things. It's like Peter is saying, Lord, I know. I know what I did. I know I failed you. I know how far, far I fell short. You know all things. But Lord, you also know this. You know that I love you. And Jesus restored him to a place of leadership in the church after that encounter. And I love that scene because once again we see Jesus do this and this is the Lenten journey. This is what Lenten so much is about. Jesus takes us, uh, I mean he saw this woman at the well and, and brought up her, her failed marriages. He, he, he sees people the way they are. He sees them in their sin. He sees them in their, in their sickness. He, he calls them out. He understands what's going on. He sees right into their heart. I mean, that's kind of the Lenten journey. Jesus takes us to the truth of our lives. And here we see it again. Jesus takes Peter back to this great failure in his life where he denied Jesus three times. And he says, he gives him an opportunity to confess his love for him. And that's the Lenten journey. The Lord comes to us and takes us to the cross, the place where we are, the truth is seen for all that it is. Evil is seen for all that it is. Our sin is seen for all that it is. We, we go to the cross because we see sin for what it is, the ugliness of it. We go to the cross and we, we have no pride when we go to the cross. We go to the cross and says, yeah, I put Jesus there. Uh, we go to the cross and we recognize that. But what we find in the cross is that Jesus went to the cross because he wants to rescue us from our sin. He goes to the, the lowest places and reaches out our, his hand and says, I want to take you through this. I want to take you through it. And I want to rescue you from the, the deepest places, the darkest places you could ever have. I want to save you from that. And so the cross and the resurrection is the place where love of God frees us to be honest. Love of God frees us. We don't have to close our eyes to the horrible truths of life. Jesus meets us there. And it's not just our sin and condemnation that dies on the cross. It is our pride that dies in our cross. We die with him. Our baptism says that. We have been crucified with Christ and now we live a new life. We journey to the cross. And then we live a life in great humility just with our eyes on Jesus every day we follow him let's bow our heads forward a prayer follow, Father we follow our Lord into the garden of Gethsemane and we see his love for us we see uh, him on the cross and as the song says we were there when they crucified our Lord we were there and Father we come Lord to you today recognizing that Lord you know our convictions you know sometimes Lord we've made a lot of boast all of us have we've made boast and, and, and we've been confident that we're going to serve you and that we're going to follow you and we're going to change the way we live and yet like Peter we have when the moment has, has, has been, when the moment of truth has come, we've not followed the truth. 
And so we come before you today and you see it all. Lord, you know us. You know it all. We acknowledge there are times when our confession does not meet the way we live. Where we, the gap between our profession and our real life is, is, is not, is too wide. So Lord, we come and confess that. And we are thankful that, that you have forgiven us. We are thankful that your love comes to us. And now, Lord, help us to do what Paul says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is to head. We keep our eye on the prize. We keep our eye on you. Help us this day to, to live and to move forward this week to live out of a response to your spirit. With our eyes just focused on you and allow you to be the Lord of our life, not determining where we're going to do and what we're, how you're going to lead us, but we're going to just listen to what you have to say to us. Help us, Father, to, to allow our deepest convictions about who you are to be rea reality in the daily life and to make a difference in what we're, how we live. Now, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Lenten journey. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in our hearts to will and to act according to your good purpose. Help us to be your servants as we live for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless. Go in peace.